Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome everyone who joined us today. First, uh, let me welcome our four members and participants uh, for Davos Agenda Week to this discussion, but also everyone streaming online at www.weform.org around the world. Thank you for joining us today. Today's panel discussion will be taking place in two parts. We will be, get, be beginning with a 30-minute public panel discussion, which we will follow, be followed by a 30-minute private dialogue attended by our four members. This 30-minute public panel, uh, which we will begin shortly, will be recorded and will be available on our website uh, shortly after the conclusion of this discussion. The context of why we are here today is one in which the COVID-19 pandemic has reminded us that we face a series of risks that are increasing in frequency and severity. Building greater resiliency to these risks, whether relating to pandemics, climate change, cyber attacks, or other risks has become more important than ever to build a more resilient and sustainable and prosperous future. Today's discussion, reassessing corporate risk and reinforcing resilience in the post-COVID world, will focus on how stakeholders um, can deliver against this imperative, and in particular, how the private sector has a critical role to play. This discussion builds on several initiatives uh, that we are uh, undertaking here at the Forum to explore some of the solutions and the partnerships and the efforts that can build greater resilience um, in the world today. You may have seen last week, the Forum released our annual global risk report, um, which talked about societal fractures, environmental degradation, uh, and geopolitical fragmentation as some of the risks that we'll be facing over the next year. Our COVID-19 Financial Services Response Network and our Insurance and Asset Management Industry Action Group are two groups as well that have looked at specifically the vital role the private sector can play in building this resiliency agenda, publishing last September a document uh, and a call to action on how we build a more resilient and sustainable world with an action plan for those industries which you can find on our website. And finally, our transformational uh, investment initiative in partnership with our institutional investor community, which is looking at collectively how investors can champion long-term thinking to constructively tackle complicated problems while pursuing attractive risk-adjusted uh, investment returns. This is a vital yet complicated topic. And for this reason, we're thrilled to have a panel today with various unique perspectives that will come to, uh, to this discussion. And we're extremely happy as well to have Lidfi Siddiqui joining us today to moderate the session. Lidfi is a young global leader uh, of the World Economic Forum. He's a managing director at the CFA Institute and is also a visiting professor in practice at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Lidfi, thank you for joining us today from Singapore. Uh, I will turn it over to you now uh, for a great discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. And hello, good morning, and good afternoon, everyone from here in Singapore. Today's discussion is about reinforcing resilience, not just the management of known risks, but also preparedness for and recovery from unknown risks. Specifically, our exam question today is whether private corporations and investment capital can play a leadership role in building systemic resiliency? Is it possible to get out of a hyper-efficiency mindset, a short-term mindset, and carry some redundancies along in the system that may have previously been seen to be wasteful? At a time of geopolitical distancing and apparently reduced state-level cooperation compared to, say, the aftermath of the global financial crisis, is there a role for private sector cooperation to step into the breach can private sector decisions, especially investment decisions, be more intentional towards environmental and social outcomes? Are there opportunities as we emerge from this tragic global pandemic to accelerate the march towards sustainable development goals, stakeholder capitalism, which was the theme of Davos last year? Is there a case to be made that inclusion is a strategic imperative for businesses especially when viewed through the lens of risk resilience. The World Economic Forum's most recent uh, annual risk report uses the word inequality and variations of that 15 times in just the executive summary. Imbalance, fragmentation, fractures, uneven, disproportionate, variance of the same thing. And taking stock of the year that has been and reflecting on the risk perception survey, the latest survey, it points to at least three things. Number one, the need to take a holistic systems-wide view of risk impact, 
So focus not just on this risk factor or that risk factor, but multiple risk factors that interact and can amplify exponentially through feedback loops. Secondly, the need to improve risk communications. It's hard enough communicating statistics and probabilities in the best of times without having to contend with misinformation during a crisis. And thirdly, the need for new novel forms of partnership, public-private partnerships on risk preparedness. So on that backdrop, I am delighted to introduce our distinguished panel. I will invite uh, each one of them uh, to make some opening remarks in response to the exam question that I outlined above. Uh, I will introduce them just before it's their turn to speak. So let me start with Ms. Anne Richards. Anne Richards, CBE, is the Chief Executive Officer of Fidelity International, previously Chief Executive of M&G Investments and Chair of the Financial Conduct Authority, FCA's Practitioner Panel. Amongst many other accolades, she's also an Honorary Fellow of CFA UK. Ms. Richards, welcome, and your opening remarks, please. Uh, lovely. Thank you very much. Uh, and good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world, everybody who's watching. Um, it's been a fascinating 12 months. It's been many things over the last 12 months. But one of the things that I think we've all wrestled, both as investors and actually as managers of businesses, is how do you get to the heart of what it means to be running a resilient business? And I think for us, there's a triumvirate of things which we link very closely together as we're thinking about what it means for corporates to try and navigate um, some of the things that have been thrown into such sharp relief over the last 12 months. And the triumvirate is a combination of survivability, of sustainability, and of resilience. And what I mean by that is it's clear as a business, you won't, you cannot survive unless you are both resilient and have a sustainable business model. So we link very closely the thoughts around resilience to thoughts around sustainability and why they're both such important facets of building a business that really can last, can be sustained in the very long term. So that's the sort of the, the context setting for this. Um, now, when, as an investor, when you look at the world and through this lens, you never meet a management team on the other side of the table who tells you they're not resilient. That's never an opening statement, we're not resilient. But somehow or other, I think we as investors have to find a way of getting to the bottom of where just in time means that just in case management has been, has been forgotten. And that's what we are trying to build into our own sustainability framework. And we frame this through thinking around, first of all, how you should respond to external threats versus how you should respond to internal threats, because they require somewhat different approaches in terms of your management techniques to thinking about how you build financial resilience, people resilience, and a whole bunch of other uh, sorts of resiliences within them. It comes down to uh, the difference between the preparedness that you need on the one hand to be prepared for external shocks and the prevention that you need in order to prepare for internal shocks. So it's a combination of pre prevention and preparedness. But in both cases, the final element is contingency. And I think it's the contingency element that is too easy for managements to forget about. It's the inch wide, mile deep, or 2.54 centimeters wide and 1.6 kilometers deep threats, that it's too easy for management to think they are stepping over. But actually, when the cracks happen, you really slip right down them. So our, our premise is, in just in conclusion, that thinking about resilience within that framework of sustainability and thinking about it in a way which then provides really measurable outcomes, which we investors can start to rate, will ultimately lead to higher ratings for companies over time. And that's really the goal that we are trying to get to. And we will try and build that proof statement over time. But that is our contention and trying to get that balance right between what is excessive redundancy versus what is appropriate redundancy in this in the supply chain, in the management and operational structures. That's the, the heart of what we're trying to get at. I'll stop there, Lotfi. Back to you. Thank you, Ms. Richards. I'll come back to you with a follow-on question, probably around how do you do that balance between the cost 
of carrying redundancies uh, in a competitive uh, environment where uh, others might be cutting costs. I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, now on to Mr. Kirill Dimitrov. Mr. Dimitrov is the chief executive officer of the Russian Direct Investment Fund, one of the world's prominent sovereign wealth funds, $10 billion of assets under management. He has previously headed several large private equity funds, having started his career at Goldman Sachs and McKinsey. Mr. Dimitrov uh, and I, we shared a panel on geoeconomics competition uh, six years ago in Davos. Some of the trends of divergent international cooperation uh, that we spoke about then, unfortunately, seem to have diverged even more. So over to you, sir, uh, your opening remarks. Thank you so much, Lutfi. It's really a great pleasure to be here. And I think we are one of the key panel in Davos because the topic of resilience uh, is yeah. definitely a topic that is at the core of our last 12 months. It's at the core of what is to come. So it's a pleasure to be here. You know, when I read Nassim Taleb's book, Black Swans, I really paid attention to it, but I didn't anticipate that we'll have a flock of black swans coming, or you can use even the term swarm of black swans that has been swarming around the world uh, in the last 12 months, and uh, we expect more black swan swarms to come. And I think it is related to this really point of singularity that we go through, not only in terms of technological singularity, but also in terms of singularity on divisive changes, uh, on really politics and divisiveness creating barriers for international cooperation, and even on some brain changes that are driven by technologies. So we have lots of singularities happening at the same time, and we believe that they accelerate those black spawn events, and I think how we are prepared for them is a key topic. And rather than being theoretical, I'd like to briefly share seven very brief points on our experience at Russian Direct Investment Fund in dealing with pandemics, because it believes it's useful for how similar issues can be approached going forward. So first of all, we really focused on rule number one, which is understanding the problem, the resilience problem we face early. And in early January, we understood that uh, COVID is very uh, significant and we really focused on this. Uh, point number two, we really focused on where we can make the biggest difference. And we understood that we could finance tests, a drug, and a vaccine as basically three core elements of our contribution to fighting COVID. Point number three, we really picked partnerships. And we understood that only through partnerships we can overcome, including global partnerships. We had bi-weekly calls with other sovereign wealth funds, with top pharma companies, top pharma producers, to really identify what is the best testing technology. What is the best anti-COVID drug to back? What is the best vaccine out there? And we believe we succeeded because our test, uh, you know, has been really important because it's very fast and the same precision as PCR. Uh, we have developed one of the two antiviral COVID drugs uh, in the world. And now Sputnik V vaccine <laughs> has been covered a lot in media in many aspects uh, of the vaccine. Uh, point number four is serving society. I think once you really have all those crises, it's very important that your business, private business, public business, is serving society. And I think serving society is sort of the theme going forward because uh, point number five, there is lots of misunderstanding media attacks that, for example, Sputnik V faced, et cetera, and being resilient to those media attacks building direct communication, uh, building basically strategy in the world that has attention span close to zero <laughs> with new and new, uh, new cycles changing, uh, you know, and uh, people not being able to go at the core of things and really focus on, on the basic things is very important. And the last two point, uh, point number six, foreseeing next words. So what are the next ones that can come? And we believe it's about inflation. I think inflation is about to come in a massive way following all of the printing of money around the world. Uh, obviously, not the pandemic is a possibility, and what we've done to work on this one will be important. We are talking about major environmental issues. Of course, terrorism risk has been sort of forgotten a little bit, but it's still a major threat. So I think we need to have this global resilience. And again, I'll emphasize that we believe that division and political biases are the biggest roadblock for global resilience, for global cooperation, is they need to be overcome 
through specific work of different countries on issues that bring us together. And my point number seven of resilience and the final point is meditation. I think if we all meditate well, if we all come down a little bit, if we all focus that we are humans and we need to work together, it will help us overcome the roadblocks to resilience that we face. Thank you so much, Lotfi. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dimitri. The role that we can all play from our respective positions and yours clearly from the position of finance and capital. I will come back to you with a follow-up question on that. Um, allow me to now go to Mr. David Craig. Mr. Craig is the CEO of Refinitiv, previously president of Thomson Reuters Financial and Risk Business. Prior to that, he founded the Governance Risk and Compliance Business, GRC, at Thomson Reuters. He's a board member of the Atlantic Council in Washington, D.C., and he is trained as a pilot with the Royal Air Force. Mr. Craig, your opening remarks, please. Thank you, Lafie, and, and, and good morning. Um, I, I'd start just with a couple of points. One is that um, uh, we're more fragile than we thought. Um, we're probably more complacent than we ought to be, and we're certainly more connected than we've ever been. Uh, and it's hardly surprising. The last 50 years have been a little bit strange in that there haven't been really a major social, political, um, uh, there's been no major war. There's been the last solar flare was in 1859, and that took out the telegram system at the time. I'll come on to that later. Uh, the last global pandemic was in 1918. The last major volcanic eruption was Krakatoa that put um, clouds in the sky for several years. And, and so I think we, um, this pandemic, if there's a positive, it's going to challenge our thinking um, because that complacency is compounded by the additional risk of being far more connected with our digital networks, our employee networks, um, and frankly, in a world where governments are less prepared and less connected. Um, as well um, to deal with that. Um, I, I think the other thing that we learned from this crisis in particular, particularly having sat through years of risk meetings where people poured over, um, I would say fairly micro risk, but I don't think any board member ever asked me, what would you do in a pandemic? Is, is you kind of, you can't plan for everything, so you need to plan for anything. Um, and as well as the points that um, Anne was making about the sustainable business model, which I think are, are, are really important, um, is your business model prepared for disruption that you can't expect? Um, and, and I think what we've learned in life is we always prepare for the last crisis, but never the next one. Um, Hurricane Sandy on the east coast of the US and New York, I learned through that that whilst uh, um, everyone had planned resiliency, a few of our clients had put data centers that were 10 miles within each other, and the size of the storms these days means that that, that doesn't work. We all remember the terrible events of 9-11 and, and the problem with data resiliency of cables running through the same part of Manhattan um, to do that. And my concern with this response is that the digital companies, uh, like ourselves, frankly, are all saying, well, we've actually successfully managed this being very, very digital and the less digital companies haven't. But you know, what happens if there's a major solar flare or um, an issue or a, a magnetic bomb um, that takes out technology? So. Um, and some of the things I'll reflect on, too, that the panelists said, that you cannot be too lean in operations and you cannot be too short term. And by operations, I mean both the most important asset we all have, which is our people. And how do you make sure you've got resilience, redundancy, overlapping in centers and people? Um, and also, how do you make sure your supply chain um, has resilience and is not too concentrated? And I think as um, some of the work we're actually doing with the World Economic Forum now on technology risk, is looking at the dangers of concentration in technology, um, uh, particularly as you know, software viruses can spread even faster than human viruses. Um, and how do we make sure even unintended, accidental, or deliberate viruses um, don't take that um, that kind of course? Um, the, the last point I'll, I'll make, obviously, um, being a, a world leader in data, is talking about the, the data. And, and whilst there's um, there are chances to look ahead of a crisis and to try and predict what might happen. In fact, hedge funds were looking at sentiment data this time last year to really try and understand that the extreme size of the, um, the outbreak. Um, in the crisis, data can be incredibly important. And there's a big difference between countries and governments that have been good at managing data and how they've responded to the crisis and countries and companies that, that have not. So actually being quick and adapt to get the right data to understand the extent um, of a crisis, how to respond, 
But also, you know, to your point about private sector versus government um, and how they can work together, I think data sharing mechanisms are are incredibly important. Um, you know, China shared the, the COVID-19 genome sequence and over the weekend people were mapping it um, in Oxford and other places around the world where the vaccine was being developed. So I think there's some very, very important learnings too about the sharing and accessibility of data. At a time when there are more data protection and resilience um, rules going in place, sometimes for localization and protection of people's individuals, sometimes for state interests. But I think we've got to be very, very careful about allowing those to um, stop the, the, the sharing of the right data at the right time that can help us respond to these crises. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Craig. You make a, a great point about um, our habit of focusing on the risk radar of what's visible versus what's coming from, from the, the outside. And this, uh, the concept of Nassim Taleb's black swan, but there's also Michelle Walker's gray rhino. So risks that are very much present. You can see the rhino over there, but there seems to be hesitation to act upon it until the rhino charges, at which point it's probably too late. Uh, my question to you when I come back would be around, um, you mentioned that we're more connected, which makes risks um, spread a lot more easy, easily. How do we prevent this possible backlash of reducing connectivity in the name of affirming resilience? So I'll come back to you uh, on that one. If I can um, go up to uh, Ms. Anne Richards, please. I have um, two questions for you. I'll ask the first one very quickly, which is, you mentioned contingency, but contingency is optionality, and optionality has a cost of carry and you're spending money on something that you will not need. How do you justify that? So look, I think there's, um, there's, there's two ways of, of looking at that. The, the first is partly it's about the shape of the risk profile that you're willing to look at. Are you, you know, do you, do you clip the coupon um, and take the short term benefit of not, of not managing the redundancy? for the risk of the big hit at the end, or actually do you prefer a smoother profile? And there is a business choice within that, within, within degrees. <clears throat> but I'm not sure that the overall profile necessarily um, comes out with a better or worse outcome when you average all of that out. And I would argue that the smoother profile is probably more valuable over time. So I think that's one way of looking at it. The other thing is I think you can get very smart about um, how you build redundancy, dual redundancy into your model. And the more that you can identify where the single points of failure are and build in pipes that allow you to um, switch between. So the pipes are used, but you have enough additional capacity that you can switch in between. The more you build that smart redundancy in, actually the additional cost of it in many parts of your operational structure are probably less than you think. So it's about smart redundancy, dual redundancy and failover. It's not about a wholesale additional cost. And there is a balance to it and I accept that, but I think it is possible to do much more than many companies have historically done. Smart redundancy, to go with smart agility, that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, very quickly, the other question I wanted to ask you is around ESG and responsible investing in that whole area. It's very heartening to see that so much progress has been made over there. But how do we energize, empower, harness the passion here while at the same time avoid this space getting contaminated, if you like, by tokenism or window, window dressing or impact washing, that sort of stuff? Gosh, well, it's, you know, it's, it, there's, there's an awful lot of fear of impact washing or greenwashing going on. And I think it's, it's fair to say that we are on a journey. But the vast majority of people that I interact with and come across are very passionate, uh, even people who would not necessarily have been in that camp three, four, five years ago, about understanding that this is a direction of travel that we're going in. And so, you know, I think the I think the coming together of all the different taxonomies, the sort of convergence into commonly accepted standards, which can then be properly measured against, is the way that we will cut through all of this. Right. Um, but I think the direction of travel is right. So, you yes. know, I, I worry less about that than about the overarching sense that we are moving forward. Thank you. 
Uh, Mr. Dimitri, if I can come back to you now. Uh, you mentioned cooperation and you gave us examples of uh, communication, collaboration with other sovereign wealth funds and so on. And I, I see this, um, uh, you know, many investors taking a systems view to investment, catalyzing investment in areas, crowding in private capital where private capital may not have gone without the nudge and the initiative from sovereign wealth funds. In your experience, how do you overcome the possible suspicion, the geopolitical suspicion, the perception that sovereign money comes with geopolitical strings attached? Does that get in the way? And is there a way to overcome that? Well, I think particularly with Russia, you know, we work uh, a lot on dispelling uh, really lots of misunderstandings uh, on this. But, you know, what we've done, for example, you know, our Sputnik V vaccine is now registered in 14 countries. We'll have more than 25 registered within the next couple of weeks. And we really worked with each individual country. We have lots of private partners in different nations who will also be producing the vaccine. We co-invest with them together. And I think it really helps us that we have a network of of sovereign wealth funds in 20 nations who worked with us successfully, who understands that we do not have political biases, who understands that we are a good partner. And this work of sovereign wealth partners in 20 countries creates for us a very good foundation to work with private businesses in those nations who otherwise would not really know how Russian direct investment fund operates. So I think this partnership approach is very important. And also, I think, uh, you know, uh, David mentioned something very important about supply chain, um, you know, issues and other issues. I think, you know, lots of private businesses need and can work with sovereign wealth funds to really, um, uh, you know, get lots of financial support because governments are also thinking about supply chain issues and how to make sure those are resilient. So there is lots in public-private uh, cooperation, and uh, we believe that sovereign wealth funds are great partners for private businesses. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Craig, I, I have two questions for you. The first one in response to your comments, which is about connectivity. How do we avoid going back into our shells? The second one, if I may ask you both together, um, what's the role and responsibility for media platforms, data platforms, in ensuring that information is used to diffuse risk and not maliciously contribute to it? Gosh, so connectivity, I'll take the first question. Um, I mean, we're incredibly connected. It's almost impossible to imagine many global companies not operating in, in the way that they, they do today. So I don't necessarily subscribe to the idea that suddenly we will retrench back to our national um, borders. It's, it's almost impossible to think of that um, re really happening for, for most major companies, certainly technology companies, um, to do that. So I think the approach has to be, how do I work in a, in a very connected world um, and I think something in our mindset that we have to change is that um, I was um, listening to Anne's comments about resilience and redundancy. Um, uh, we look at it um, as capacity. And, and actually, if you build networks that can increase capacity, and at the moment we live in a very, very volatile world, so actually we have to put more capacity aside on any given day to deal with the peaks and troughs. Uh, what you actually end up find that you're doing is you're in effect building redundancy into the system, but actually it's not an extra cost because you need it in any case. So you have parallel runs, you have parallel teams, you have teams that are cross-skilled in different countries and different parts of the world to do similar roles and similar jobs. And, and so there are ways of actually managing um, um, through this. So, you know, and I think, again, we've just got to change our mindset, the mindset that you had a, uh, a big spare office you know, outside the centre of London and that all of your traders went there in a pandemic it is, you know, do you remember in the early days of this, they tried that and it obviously didn't work. I mean, we just have to change our mindset. We always respond to the last crisis to design for the next one. And I think what we've learned from this is that actually having everyone and every employee isolated in their own home, and, and they, we have you know thousands of BCP centers, if you like, it's their own home. No one predicted that, but how do we enable it? Now we should think about the next crisis. I worry about technology risk of being from my seat and where I am and how do we think about building capacity, result, redundancy, and protection into our technology networks um, as well? I think it's something that, that all of us need to consider very, very carefully, particularly as we're relying much, much more on third parties to provide cloud-based analytics and solutions, which do give tremendous redundancy, uh, but also give risks as well. 
you know, on, on social media and, and news and data platforms, I mean, the search for truth um, in these pandemics is, is very hard. Um, and um, the amount of misinformation that's generated from all sources, not just government, but individuals and, and other areas, interested parties, um, is terrible. One thing that we found is that actually um, in this situation, with you know, we have 18,500 employees, um, actually our employees have looked up to us for the truth, the employer. Um, when often the government or the, the news information sources aren't giving them the information we, they need, we've stepped up and actually helped them um, to understand what's happening, when a vaccine's arriving and those things. So I, I do think that this is a real challenge um, and that actually companies um, have had to step into this void, frankly, to help supply some of the information that, frankly, um, people need to trust from some source somewhere because they're getting fed a lot of noise that, that just isn't right. Thank you. Uh, and with that, we come to the end of this public segment uh, of our discussion.